unified terror, which paralyzes needed effort to convert. All right, and we are live. Thank you so much to everybody for joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited about this one. I have been loving doing these interviews with, under the Accelerate Us dispatches from the front lines of the local economy revolution. And I've been loving them in part because I get to talk to people that I don't always have time to talk to. And they're like the coolest people that I know. And they're doing fascinating you know work all over the country so these are i'm like super excited to be able to 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 help some of you you know discover folks that you haven't encountered before or just kind of learn more about um you know interesting people and interesting work so i'm della rucker i'm the principal of the wise economy workshop and chair and uh communications manager i chair some things too Wrong call. Um, I, I'm the communications manager for the American Independent Business Alliance. In addition to Wise Economy, I'm also the uh, co-founder and chief community officer of Econogy. Um, Enoch Elwell, who is with us today, also has about 14 different titles, and uh, you know, does is is one of these just awesome human beings who can do you know amazing intellectual work and like make amazing stuff at the same time so i just asked enoch if we could show the tree houses in his backyard that he built and rented uh the brush is too high right now so i'm going to attach links to that uh to the to the blog page that has the rest of the information from uh this interview when we're done but um so enoch you are yeah, I'm just really, really happy to get to see you again. It's been a while. Well, man, it's so great to be here, Della. Thank you for inviting me. And it's good to just uh, be uh, here in the same virtual room with you and uh, and, and some others. Uh, keep missing each other. And uh, every time we get a chance to catch up, it's, it's always good. You're doing great work. And it's good to be here with you today. Awesome. Awesome. So just for sake of framework, you are outside of Chattanooga. You are in, um, you've got Stone Mountain behind you, is that correct? Yeah, Lookout Mountain, that's right. Yeah, so Oak Park in the city of Chattanooga. Um, and uh, here, here at my property where we have some tree houses uh, up in the woods behind us. So, yeah, very cool stuff. Um, Enoch is the co-founder and is now in charge of kind of special initiatives for uh, co-starters. So I want to start out by just giving people some framework on what co-starters is, um, you know, kind of kind of how it works and particularly how it's different from um, other kinds of business development, entrepreneurship development kind of training, because you guys took a very different tack on that. So I want to give that framework and then if you could talk a little bit about kind of how co-starters came to be kind of give us the origin story that'd be awesome great so so co-starters you're right uh, we're, we're doing things a little bit differently here um and and really the the idea behind co-stars came from a couple things one my personal experience my original life goal is to be the best guitar maker out there so I trained under the lead guy for Martin Guitars and was really learning the skill to be, you know, a best in class creative entrepreneur. Um, and along the way discovered that there's not many great resources out there for people who, um, you know, are trying to just make something beautiful and share it with the world in a sustainable way, where business isn't the goal as much as just the necessary evil to, to you know, achieve some other life goals or share something good with the world. And so um, my personal frustration was, you know, not really finding that support network of like-minded people and resources that were optimized in the way our culture is, our, our even just our kind of purpose as a society um, in, uh, you know, pursuing like success being measured in, you know, increasing wealth, you know, for business, you know, uh, maximizing shareholder wealth, right? Or, or for communities, you know, increasing, uh, you know, economic output. Mm -hmm. and, and saw so many people had a growing dissatisfaction with, with those goals and really feeling some dissonance, like this isn't maybe all there is, or this isn't enough. And so realizing that there, there's, there's an opportunity and a need to um, look for a better or deeper meaning or purpose of business, while also for those who are just trying to do wonderful things and find a way to do them sustainably, how do those things connect? And that's really where CoStarters was born, 
this idea, what if we can flip the story around so that business is actually something that serves human flourishing, people being healthy and finding the best way forward and community flourishing, you know, thriving communities. What if thriving communities and thriving people could be, could be built up through business and we could use business as a tool that serves us instead of us serving, you know, business economic output ends. So that's really the idea the philosophy behind Code Starters. And then we set about set out to build as many programs or tools or resources or engagement models that help that could help bring people together in community to figure out their own problems and learn collaboratively uh, how to solve the problems of today with each other, um, building a strong support community along the way, and uh, you know, breaking through the the roadblocks in front of each other uh, to to find success in, uh, personally in the business. So that's Co Starters. A uh, little different, um, you know. Uh, a lot of people resonate with that deeply and. Uh, they find business success, but also personal and, and community transformation um, in the co-starters community and network. Um, and a lot of people just don't quite get it and wonder why all this fancy community stuff. You know, you could just uh, you know go online and learn the five steps to you know five steps to scalable tech company and, and be be off with it. Um, but that's not really uh, that's not really our, our thing. So, how's that for a summary? That's a great summary. And give us a sense of the scope at this point. So Co-Starters has worked with folks um, nationwide and to some extent internationally. You've got a, a ton of sort of Co-Starters communities um, working in all sorts of different places. So why don't you give us a picture of the scope? Sure. So um, it's amazing how this, this uh, kind of movement has spread over the years. Um, I think it really um, it points to the, the hunger that exists in communities everywhere both from, from leadership in a community to, to see um, see more opportunity in the community than exists or has been realized. Um, and also the belief that business owners and just people um, have, you know, we all individually have what, what it takes to, to transform our, our communities through our work. And so um, that has really taken off. So right now we're supporting a little over 200 communities around the world, mostly in the U.S., mostly in rural communities in the U.S. Um, or, or other kind of dis, disadvantaged communities. Um, and then uh, over the past couple, several years, we've helped over 12,000 businesses start, which is just uh, really exciting to see. Um, and that's accelerating uh, every year. So just in the past several weeks with COVID-19, we really focus our energy on helping existing business owners figure out how to, you know, stabilize, refocus and, and make it through this time, but also uh, reinvent to, you know, come out stronger through this time. And uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Just in the past few weeks, we've been able to support over a thousand businesses around the country, which has been really oh, wow. exciting um, and very much needed in this time. What? T tell us a little bit about that. That after you finish uh, hacking up along, uh, what are you, what are you? Tell us a little bit about the um, what you've been been doing with. And forgive me, I, I should have thought that we would talk about this, but I'm blanking about a name of the the seminars that you've been doing to help people figure out their pivot or figure out their new way forward. Sure. So right now we have um, taken some some models that we've used over the years that we found to be really helpful with uh, business owners in solving their own problems. And we've made those available online specifically to help businesses navigate the COVID-19 crisis. And so um, if you go to our website, co-starters.co slash road to recovery, you can see the whole lineup of support from uh, curating the overwhelming number of resources and lists that are out there. We've tried to make a, a way to connect you with the list for you um, as quickly as possible to a, uh, a two-hour pivot workshop how to refocus, which is essentially just helping you get from, you know, overwhelmed with all the things that you could do or should do and figuring out tactically what is the best thing for me to do now and next and how do I kind of get out of get out of the analysis paralysis and know that I'm taking the best next steps forward for my need today. And then we have uh, the rebuild program, um, which is about two months of intensive support where about 20 businesses get together with each other in a facilitated peer support um, environment to help each other, not just, you know, stabilize for today, but actually build momentum to come out of this time strongly going forward. So all of those are available now. They're on our website. We've uh, made them available at cost because we're trying to just get this help out to as many people as we can. So I'd love for you to check that out um, for yourself as a business or to share across your community as well. Great, great. So one of the things I, I saw you doing and you know, and, and you and I have known each other for a long time, but I, I stumbled across an interview, uh, I think it was a Facebook Live that you were doing with um, a gentleman a couple of weeks ago. 
And you said, and, and I, it was Ram, um, I can't recall his name. Um, I, hopefully you'll be able to, to help fill that in. But um, you, you, have, you said this wonderful thing about the impact of density of entrepreneurs and the impact of density of entrepreneurs on a community. And I thought that was just, that was, that was a really fabulous image. And I'm hoping you can unpack that a little bit for me. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Della. That's something actually I just ripped off from somebody. Um, so I'll, I'll give, I'll quote, quote the source. And if you want to read the whole book on it, um, I'd highly recommend the book called Team of Teams by oh. General Stanley McChrystal. Um, so there's a lot of good there. Um, pretty much the sum of that story is um, when the, the United States Special Forces uh, were fighting in Afghanistan, the Taliban, they originally were getting routed um, because, uh, you know, United States Special Forces, which many could say are, you know, the, the best of our efficiency hierarchical models, you know, that exist yeah. in the world, they were getting owned by these loose networks of, of uh, terrorist cells who were very adaptable, very reconfigurable. They had the network mm -hmm. leadership model figured out. And so it's kind of a, it was kind of an example of, you know, maybe old, old organizational models versus new organizational models with the new organizational models winning. And so General uh, McChrystal had to adapt on the fly and figure out, um, mm. first he realized the issue wasn't a uh, issue of, um, you know, having more resources or having more people or having more, you know, uh, technology. It was actually an mm. issue of organizational structure and organizing structure. And wow. he had to fix that on the fly and his book is all about that. But to sum up that whole thing, it comes down to two key concepts. And, and you know, Del, we could talk a little bit more about density of just people, but Actually, what I'm finding is one of the maybe misnomers we've used is we, we assume that density means geography, like lots of people close to each other. And, and so people then make the assumption, well, then if you're in a rural community, then mm -hmm. sorry, you know, um, you're going to lose. But really, I think the thing that matters most and that's very important is its density of trust, its density of relationship. And, and with technology and with the way we can be connected, you know, through all kinds of different mediums, we don't have to live close to each other to have strong trust. In fact, um, there's stronger trust that may exist, uh, you know, across, uh, uh, you know, networks that, that are maintained through email or phone or, or whatever than, than yeah. next, next necessarily with the neighbors in your suburb, right? And so um, what we found is that density of trust is so essential, but that's also paired up with another thing that's required, which is clarity of purpose. When you have density, trust, and clarity of purpose, those two together uh, just just nurture and accelerate healthy functioning community or ecosystems or economic models or whatever, right? And so those are, I think, some of the, the key principles to anything we do. So density of trust, to go a little bit deeper on that, is the idea of um, having having strong relationship, right? Um, having um, uh, being willing to, to help each other, uh, being willing to support each other, uh, being willing to uh, give each other the benefit of doubt, being willing to um, give before you get, right? All those things, when there's density of trust, they kind of naturally flow. Um, but you don't just fabricate trust. It's not made up overnight. Um, in fact, uh, trust, you know, is very hard won sometimes um, and can be easily lost. And that's where clarity of purpose comes in. The great example of COVID-19 is um, this stories are everywhere all over the country where uh, maker the maker movement right has had its moment mm -hmm. where people are producing PPP all over and these random people who have no formal job title of PPE producer you know just self organize and help each other out and just move mountains because they have strong clarity of purpose right we need masks there's a shortage. We're going to do something about it and we're going to do everything we can to make this one goal happen, get mass to people, right? And so they organized in an incredible way because there was strong clarity of purpose. And that clarity of purpose created huge trust where people who never met each other were meeting in back alleys, dropping off piles of elastic and sewing for each other for free and all the, you know, mm -hmm. huge amounts of trust and self-sacrificing giving. I couldn't tell you how many hours and kind of dollar value of, of giving was made to each other, people who never met each other because they had strong clarity of purpose. That made density of trust, which then cycles back around. So if the, the purpose starts shifting, it's really hard when you have ambiguous purpose, right? To be able to navigate that and land it well. But if you have strong trust, you're able to weather that um, because of the, the relational value that's been built. So those two together are so important. 
Awesome. Why do you think the the trust component and the example you use with the maker movement and and people collaborating and doing that in a context where everybody and their mother is being told six feet away from each other and you know don't don't talk to people you don't know and oh my god oh my god oh my god um i mean that that is a, a pretty incredible story and and obviously trust is a really core underpinning but how does how does clarity of purpose and how to and trust how do how do those reinforce each other Right, so uh, I'll, I'll start with a, a picture story here of sorts. So um, I've got, I've got three, have a good story. I've got three little kids, so I wish I had puppets or something. No, I'm not gonna do that. But uh, I, I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with like the, the crocodile and the little plover bird. You know about those? So they, they're the, plo the bird that cleans the teeth of the crocodile. So the crocodile will sit there on the banks of the river with its mouth open. These little tiny birds will come in and peck at their teeth and clean off their teeth, right? So that is like the example of density, trust, and clarity purpose, right? Because there is some clear purpose going on. That bird is in the crocodile's mouth to clean its teeth, nothing else. But there's some really, that's clarity of purpose, right? And then there's some very strong trust going on. You know, that bird is entering in the crocodile's mouth and yeah. it could get chomped, um, but, mm -hmm. but, but it's not, right? Because it's, it's there for a reason. And so the trust is engendered, right? But right. at any moment, Say, for example, if that bird starts pecking at the crocodile's tongue, like it's done, right? And so you go off the clarity of purpose, you lose the trust, right? You gain the trust, you have the clarity of purpose. Um, but also, you know, because there's this, this trust that exists, um, then you're able to, to develop more clarity of purpose as well. And so, for example, you know, in, in, and we know this, like, I don't know, you could talk about working groups or committees you've been on or school projects or whatever your context is. If you came in with a group of friends that you already knew and worked with, you trusted each other, you could figure out, you could land some ambiguity pretty quickly. But then when you're thrown with this group of people you don't know or some people maybe that you're a little uneasy about, um, yeah. you're very guarded and it's very hard to land something that you all agree to because that, that density trust isn't there. Does that, does that help? Yeah, that completely helps. And, you know, interestingly, <laughs> you know, we, we really could have used the puppets. So, and with three little ones, I'm sure you've got, you know, plenty of puppet experience going on these days. Um, the, you know, one, one of the really fascinating things to me is that, yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely understand, at least for myself, where, how those two now relate to each other. And I love the fact that you brought up the, the, the situation where we have people who don't know each other or who are coming from perhaps very different backgrounds. You know, I've had, um, you know, with my ecology work, I've had student teams where we had people from, you know, multiple different professions, uh, multiple different cultures. I'm sure Enoch will be back in a second, so I will uh, give him a give him a second to get himself recon reconstituated. Um, give him one second. Are you there? I am. I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. What's that? I can hear you just fine. Uh, you've got a picture up that has a little, you know. Oh, there he is. Okay, cool. I'm so sorry about that. I got dropped. Yeah, I was. I was a little worried about that with you needing to be outside, but you know, it is a beautiful background, so we take what we can get. But, but you know, I was thinking about the fact that I've had teams that have had, you know, people who are. I, I've I've worked really hard on trying to have multi. Um, multi-discipline teams and multi-perspective teams. And one of the things that, um, you know, in our context where we were trying to put together, and we might have, you know, uh, a marketing person, an uh, engineer, a, um, a communications person, and, you know, a, a, a technical specialist, and they're young. And they may be from different, you know, grown up in different cultures or different countries, or, you know, their their first languages are different. Putting them together into a team, and and getting effective teamwork out of that team didn't magically happen. We had to put in place some 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 structures, some systems, some sort of of ground rules. So does that play into this question of density? of trust and clarity of purpose is the, is the structure in which these things are occurring? Because I can admit to use your, your you know, 
crocodile and plover, um, I could imagine that you know, part of the ground rules is, is the plover is not going to mess around with the, the crocodile's tongue, you know, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really good. I, I think, I mean, obviously, you know, this is very complex stuff. So that's a gross simplification to say, these are the only two things, right? Yeah. Um, I think it also is very helpful because it provides clarity. If you're going to put things in two buckets, those might be the two biggest buckets, right? Um, but yeah, there are ways that help accelerate this kind of stuff because if, if all this stuff naturally happened, right? Then we wouldn't have all the messes that we do. Uh, but clearly it's, it, it, you know, the laws of entropy are work or whatever, where um, we tend to fall more into disorder than order um, when we try to get together. And so, yes, um, systems, processes, structures that help accelerate trust and clarity of purpose are essential. And I think that's, so the, the, the beliefs of co-starters, and I think the magic of what co-starters is, is that we focus a whole lot on creating um, very, very, um, uh, tensional engagement processes and systems that help accelerate trust and clarity of purpose, mm -hmm. right? And that's probably the best mm -hmm. way to sum it all up. Um, and what we found is when you have some, some good processes or structures on ways of engaging, mm -hmm. then the, the value of everybody's, like that everybody brings to people comes out and you have exponential value expressed because everybody's best stuff is on the table. When you limit things to like say a lecture format of learning or or kind of the expert is the one who tells everybody what to do there could be great value in one expert's head but it's limited to that one expert's value and everybody else are the worker bees right and so there's a lot of i think the it this is a different model of of both learning and of collaboration which we don't really have the skills yet we haven't all learned the processes together as a, as a culture because we're used to kind of the top down model of someone or something has the resources and the resources are disseminated to the people who execute on them. And so I think that is one of the biggest maybe gaps we have in our culture right now, which is we don't have uh, learning models and engagement models that help us express that kind of um, density of trust and clarity of purpose um, that, that allow us to get there. And if we use hierarchical engagement models um, as the ground rules of sorts for those types of interactions, then we typically don't get there very quickly. Because if you think about it, if we use an example of someone has to set their leadership for the room to then like tell people what to do and a leader needs to be identified, then everybody's mm -hmm. kind of fighting for that leadership role, which means that you've got a lot of different cooks in the kitchen all trying to find their clarity of purpose until somebody wins. It's my purpose today, right? Um, or it's the trust thing. It's um, maybe not even trying to build trust, it's trying to say, everybody trust me, right? Um, and that's really hard to land. Excellent, excellent. You know, one of the the... I, I love the terminology that you're using because it's it's making me, you know, the words that we use often influence how we describe something. Um, I've been kind of struggling with the question of, um, as I've been phrasing it, so I'm saying this because some of the people who are watching this have heard me say other stuff, um, but of going from a hierarchical model, sometimes I've called that an industrial era model, which is, whoops, we lost him again. Um, but Enoch will know what this is, so I'll just describe an industrial era model being, you know, I'm the boss, I tell the managers what to do, the managers tell you, the the lowly people on the line, what to do, and, you know, and, and we progress in that manner. Um, that as opposed to, so Enoch referred to a density of purpose. Um, and a density of trust. And he made the point a minute ago, you know, I'm just recapping some stuff. Don't worry. It's, 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 it's life in the, in beautiful God's country, right? I would like to do a quick commercial break and say this bad wife I brought to you by Verizon. Um, <laughs> did you know that Verizon hotspots throttle their internet, their unlimited internet after 15 gigs? So apparently this month I've done 15 gigs of Zoom calls and they've decided they're going to make my internet bad as a punishment. So there you go. Uh, thanks to Verizon, we have bad internet. Hopefully they'll fix this one day. Okay. That's also my provider. So hopefully thanks to this lovely advertisement. I still have internet. Um, <laughs> at any rate, um, well said. And, and yes, you are, you know, obviously – you know, we, we have to be resilient, right? And we just, you know, we have to keep 
dealing with the crap that's handed us and bouncing back and calling it out sometimes when we see it. Um, what I was saying when you got bounced off I was that there's, so, so you know, I, I, we've talked about kind of that, that traditional hierarchical model that we all kind of came up assuming as the way things are. And when the, um, and the, and the terminology I've been using to try to kind of figure out what we're getting to next, you, you refer to density as kind of the organizing concept there. And I really love that because the concept I've been using has been about network. And I end up doing this a lot. By the way, Isaac uh, Kramer says you're a celebrity spokesman in the making. So, you know, your, uh, your, your broadcast skills all on the map there. We'll get you the contract with Verizon or Sprint next week. Um, um, sorry. I'm sorry, Della, I missed the last part of what you were saying. This is so awful. So you were talking about the density of trust and then I, I couldn't hear what you were saying, but I saw you, uh, okay. I think you were talking about weaving is my guess, yeah. but, uh, so, so, you know, network weaving is the term that, uh, some folks have used. Um, uh, I've been talking a lot about network and a network as kind of a distributed system. So yeah, I end up doing this a lot on things, but when, but that idea of density and that idea of trust, that gets to something that is more dynamic than just a, a, a network inherently or even a woven network sounds static. So I really love how, how you guys have framed that. Um, density, that. That density of network and clarity of trust can, you know, you've, you've got examples where that's made amazing impact. You've got examples um, from the 200 plus communities that you've worked with um, where, where you know, there's there's been different experiences there. Are there sort of preconditions, ground, sort of ground conditions, um, community conditions that facilitate, um, that facilitate that ability to build density of trust and clarity of purpose. What what what's yeah, in the context of that? Yeah, that's great. I, mean, I think so. So I, I feel like yeah, any answer is a non-answer, but it's it's complicated or it's complex is the word, right? There so there there are a lot of. Um, I think it's uh, the question is first of all, which attitude do you want to take toward things? You know, do you? do you as a person feel like you have a high locus of control in your community, right? Or like, you know, do you feel like you can actually make a difference or do you feel like the cards are already stacked or whatever, you know, the hand's already been dealt. And so if depending which way you look at it, you could say, well, you know, not much you can do or well, there's everything you can do. Um, and so um, for, for example, um, the in the COVID-19 response, uh, there was Del Gines just wrote a great summary article from the Kansas City Fed highlighting some rapid responses to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, it was uh, he was kind enough to uh, highlight some of the work we've been doing with co-starters, but he also uh, highlighted several other organizations, include, including Network Kansas, who uh, deployed uh, hundreds of loans in the course of uh, a few weeks because yeah. they had that strong network in place, right? They had the relationships, they had the trust, they had some clarity of purpose, some some uh, some lines of, of communication already flowing. And so they were able to just use those assets and go and do some kind of, you know, overnight success. So pretty much I think every time there's an overnight success, you look at the groundwork and the groundwork was there, there had been some way that density of trust and clarity of purpose had been building it, even if it was in a, a different lane, right? A different context, um, but it was able to be kind of used and repurposed. Um, so, so for Great. the people who say, you know, the cards have already been stacked, well, okay, sure. Um, but, uh, but you could look in different lanes, right? So for example, maybe that strong trust could have been built, built in the education sector around the school system, and then that could translate over to disaster relief. Or the maker movement could translate over to a healthcare crisis, right? Whatever. Um, but then for those who, have, those who you know, see opportunity everywhere, um, this is what I get excited about because there is always opportunity to have uh, some pretty overnight um, um, clarity, um, you know, of purpose um, if you find the right thing, right? Um, so a great example is uh, several years ago in Chattanooga, 
Um, we were a struggling community trying to, you know, position ourselves as a place you could start a business and you could stay here and not leave. And, you know, we actually tried to you know, know a little bit something about technology here. We're not a backward Southern town, all those things. Right. And we were having trouble getting our clarity of purpose. So we were just like any other community where we, you know, everybody had their own idea of where we should go and we weren't aligned. Well, um, just so happened that because some, some wonderful, um, happy accidents and some great um, foresight from some organizations, we ended up with a um, smart, um, a smart um, internet, uh, kind of gigabit uh, internet infrastructure in, in our city where um, mm -hmm. we had every home in a 600 miles square radi radius um, connected to having access to gigabit internet, fiber internet. And so um, that was our clarity of purpose as our rallying flag which was bigger than any institutions or organizations petty differences and allowed us to all align very quickly, almost overnight, around one shared purpose. In Chattanooga, we are ahead of the curve. We have we have the ground, the best technology in the world. We are a place where you can do innovative things. We are a technology forward city. And that aligned us almost instantly. And in the course of a year, it got us all going in the same direction, all putting our energy very strongly around that, that rallying flag and had a huge success for our community and build up that trust and all those other things. And so I think that's a great example of there are, like I think all of us have our own kind of, you know, gigabit internet rallying flag in our own community that's different and probably hidden, but if we can find it, it can be the thing that gets everybody to kind of rise up out of the woodwork and, and come together and put all their energy in one direction. So to me, if we're asking that question, what are those hidden rallying flags we can find? Um, that that go go beyond everybody's petty differences, but are still um, clear enough, concrete enough that people can, you know, put their energy behind it. It's it's clear, right? Clear purpose, one direction. Um, that seems to me to be one of the biggest questions. So when we work with communities, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what is that rallying flag. How do we identify that? And then how do we rally rally the the different uh, stakeholders, institutional leaders, and grassroots leaders around that? Awesome. The rallying flag, and and it's it's fascinating because you know I I come out of the um, economic development you know a good deal of my my life has been in economic development and urban planning, and the rallying flags, quote unquote, I'm borrowing your terms, I'm probably using them wrong right now, but a lot of times that's been physical developments. Right. It's been um, we're going to build a convention center. We're going to build a a, a downtown park or, or or something like that. And it's been a very physical thing. And I always kind of personally balked at that a little bit because I tend to um, just just orient personally more toward the the people networks than the physical networks, which made me a weird urban planner. Um, but the advantage of a physical thing is a rallying flag is that people can see it they can visualize it it gets it gets that very concrete thing going um, but your example with with gigabit and chattanooga city and if if people don't know the story of chattanooga's renaissance i'd really strongly recommend you look it up because it's a hell of a story um, and uh, if you could find video somewhere of enoch telling that story it's even better um, but but that that focus and that clarity you can get there but you also still have naysayers you know <laughs> how how does a um, a network with density of trust and clarity of purpose deal with that unrelenting background of like oh that's never gonna work oh we don't have the money for that oh we don't have blah 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 blah, blah. we tried that 40 years ago and it won't happen and, and I, i'm 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 demonstrating my bias by you know the 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 silly voice i'm using but but that's something that anybody who is really trying to be a change maker is um is is working on so you said noise canceling headphones. Right, I'm, I'm, I'm trolling. I'm trolling your own webinar here with uh, making a joke. So if you want to, if you want to tune out all of the naysayers, you just get some good noise canceling headphones and you're fine. Okay, <laughs> then you can't hear other people. Well, no, I guess if you're on a Zoom call, you're okay, cool. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm a joke. Yeah, um, I can't believe you're trolling your own webinar, buddy. <laughs> I had to. Um, I, know, I know that so, was hysterical. So, um, yeah, this is yeah. good. That's that's the question, though, is 
And I know that's a question that, that folks come up with, whether they're trying to just like build a community of innovators or they're trying to, you know, get gigabit into a, you know, what did you say? It was the dirtiest city in the U.S. in the 70s. Right. Yeah. Like that, you told me that story. Um, how, how do you see communities that have this density of trust and clarity of purpose dealing with all of that? Yeah, so that's a really good question, and, and really, it's something that I think I'm. I, I have a lot to learn in. Um, there's one. There's one way of doing that I am familiar with and comfortable with, and know is effective. But I know it's not the only way, right? There's a lot of different yeah. ways to, to move forward. So, um, the the way that we have found to be most helpful in addressing kind of the na the naysayers, right, is um, really. I mean, the the simple version is focus on the positive and just do. do uh, you know, uh, win them over with kindness or kill them with kindness, I guess, as some people say. But that whole idea of just keep doing enough good stuff and building enough momentum that, um, one, is it kind of drowns out any negativity, but also it's so attractive that, you know, even the naysayers come around at least at least just to look politically good, right, um, and to save face. Yeah. And so what we've really found is, and maybe a, a, an analogy that's helpful for me is, um, you know, one way to try to change the system is to outperform the system inside the system, right? So if you think about it, um, you know, the, uh, you know, at the, at the kids' summer camp, you're doing the obstacle course and there's a 10 foot wall you've got to get over. And so you just try to be faster at climbing over the wall or better at climbing over the wall, working together more to climb over the wall, right? Um, but the problem is we're assuming industrial age rules and mindsets and everything that, you know, the, the rules that the rule book had of how to run the race are true. But guess what? Actually, the rules change now. And you know what? Like, there's no rule book anymore. We're being chased by a bear and we just need to get away. And so we don't have to follow those arbitrary rules that you have to climb over the wall. We actually can just walk around it and keep going. Right? Well, if the bear's chasing you, you should, you should probably run. <laughs> or run run around it and keep going. Yeah, actually, maybe we just need to climb the wall and stand pop, right? Um, but anyway, you get the idea, right? And yeah, so yeah. we assume so much that we have to do things a traditional way, we have to deal with the naysayers, work in the system, whatever, but actually we can build a new parallel system, right? And this is there's a lot of actually well-developed thought around this, around how innovation works and all these kinds of things, how disruption works, how culture mm -hmm. change happens. You build the new parallel system and don't try to necessarily, you know, face-to-face, -face, head off, take down the, the big system, right? But build a more parallel, attractive one and create good on-ramps or ways to connect over from the, the existing incumbent system into the, the new system, right? And you know, if it's good, if it's effective, it's a, if it's attractive, it will build momentum up to the point where people realize, you know, the old system isn't working as well as a new one. I guess we need to start shifting over. And so we found that kind of a maybe non-confrontational approach, um, focusing on on building something better, and always being co positive and kind and inviting ways for the naysayers to jump into the jump into the new the new boat, right? Uh, is uh, has been very effective. I um, love that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna say another thing I think is really helpful is as a society, I really believe that we are, you know, when we look at economic trends and activities and the way we build uh, business and look at business, maybe it's shifting now. I hope it is with all of this, uh, the, the crisis we're in now, but I, I feel like as a whole, we've been on a runaway train that's getting faster and faster and we're all celebrating how much faster the train goes every minute, right? We're picking up speed. We're picking up speed. Isn't this wonderful? Technology innovation is occurring faster and faster cycles, right? Go, yeah. go team, right? We have the fastest train, and none of us are looking ahead at the cliff that we're getting faster and faster flying off of. Um, and and maybe some of us are just saying, you know, we're going to go so fast by the time we get to the cliff, you know, we'll have learned to defy gravity and wings will ma magically appear, right? Um, yeah. And so so to me, I think one of the biggest questions is how do we build that parallel track, right? That can that can actually help us, um, you know, either uh, get to the cliff um, in, a, in a healthy way or get us, a, you know, uh, uh, maybe around the cliff or get us down from the cliff or builds, gets the wings to start being built so that by the time we get to the end, we can fly. And, and I think well, those questions aren't being asked. And the question is more, how do we, while we're on the train that's getting faster, also work on the exit plan, escape plan or tra transformation plan um, at the same time? Cool. 
maybe the bear is supposed to build the you know wings on the train or something like that. Yeah, um, that's what Isaac said here in the comments. It's yeah, when the positive people come together and get results, the negative people tend to fall fall away. I think it's so true. Absolutely, absolutely. The other, you know, one thing I used to tell communities when I did more community planning was that if you have naysayers, you want to be inviting them to the table. You want to be extending the invitation to participate over and over and over again. And then at bare, bare, bare minimum, they at least can't say that they weren't welcomed. And maybe you learn something from them, you know, but more, I think very likely they learn something from you and they see that parallel track. They see that alternative possibility, hopefully, that they wouldn't have encountered except for being, you know, in in communication and attempting to be in collaboration with you. So I really love that. Ironically, as you, I kept looking up in the corner as you were talking, because I was trying to read this whole quote, but I think this is, uh, I think this is Buckminster Fuller, but I have this sitting on my, oh, that's going to be backwards, I bet. Um, that's good. It's, uh, it's, it's the old quote from, I think it's Buckminster Fuller that says, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. So, right on, Enoch. Um, the 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 wisdom of the ages backs you up on that one. Um, let me let me ask about and and for those of you who are online, um, if you have questions for Enoch, if you have, um, you know, oh, that was quick. Um, if you have questions for Enoch, if you have question, you know, if you have other issues you want to to touch on, please feel free to put them in that chat. Um, one other thing that I did want to particularly ask you about Enoch, um, the the work that you have been doing with um, all these communities nationwide. A lot of times in in general um, co starters work. You have um, people who are coming from backgrounds that don't automatically set them up for success in entrepreneurship. So, you know, we have people who want to be or or have that drive to be entrepreneurial who are who are coming from an African American community where they've never known an entrepreneur. They're coming from a background where there is no family wealth where there's no like like financial safety net to fall back on um whether you know particularly you know one of my particular interests these days is in um african-american in, in supporting and fostering um african-american entrepreneurship um that tends that's a community that i've i've had the privilege of getting to work with a little bit um but also you know people who are disabled, people who are, um, you know, veterans, people who are coming to this work of being makers and being change agents and being entrepreneurs from some disadvantaged backgrounds. Co-starters, initially, as you said, you've built out a suite of tools. In, you started with one, and then one of the ones that, that I think I saw or came to know about fairly early on was some new stra newer strategies for how to uh, take the co-starters model and particularly sort of apply it um, and, and make it more useful for people who are coming from less privileged backgrounds. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned? Uh, whoops, and we lost him again. Um, oh, there he is. That was quick. Um, what we've learned, what what you've learned, what you've, um, you know, what what has seemed to work and be beneficial um, in in the code starters network for people who might who might not fall into entrepreneurship and agency, um, that sense of being able to have a locus of control as easily as people who look like you and I. Sure. Yeah, I think that there's two things that might be helpful to talk about here. And one is, I think, um, one of the biggest issues is a narrative that we're all talking about and sharing kind of almost unconsciously slip into that 
you know, some people can't start businesses as well as other people can. And, and I'm kind of oversimplifying, but what I mean by that is there, there is unprecedented access and, um, you know, to, to anybody and everybody to start businesses in ways that we've never had before. And, mm -hmm. and also there's a huge shift, like some of these you've been talking about, where, where a lot of, it's true to it all to ignore that there's a ton of advantage that comes with having all these connections and money and, and you know, all kinds of privilege that, that different people have for whether it's because of their race or their, their lineage or their family connections or their wealth. Um, at the same time, those are becoming less and less necessary to be able to have a successful business. Um, of course, they're great accelerators. And so I think one thing that is really important is just building up a, a narrative of, of hope and opportunity of there is opportunity. Um, there's so much more opportunity for so many more people who historically have not had opportunity or as much opportunity. And, and that's, I think, something that just needs to be, let's just start from a position of opportunity first um, is, is very helpful. And, and, uh, and that's, that's good. I think a, a, a second thing I think that's really important is when this isn't so much, uh, so, so there are, are specific um, egregious, egregious, like awful um, issues in our society, you know, for, uh, for African-American individuals because of our, our historical and current racist, race issues. Um, and, you know, for, for women as business owners and for immigrants um, and for people in rural communities and for people of, of low wealth, right? Um, and of people who, um, who are not very well socially connected. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of people who fit in a category who have extra barriers that have been imposed on them by society. And, and for them, um, there, um, while there is great resources around them, some of the barriers are, are because of the societal context in which, they're, in which uh, they find themselves in, um, which some of those can be easily changed or addressed. Some of those can't. And, uh, and, and, and I think the thing that we've tried to focus on the most is the, the mindset barriers that, that are there. And, and so what we've discovered is, in general, um, there, uh, there are, people tend to uh, approach problems um, from a, um, a surviving or an achieving mindset. This is a, a research done by a lady called Ruby Payne, um, mm. pretty well, well used uh, uh, across uh, you know, a wide spectrum of, of, kind of human engagement with activities, right? Um, but this mm -hmm. idea of um, people who have grown up in hardship of any kind tend mm -hmm. to approach things more from a survival mindset. How can I make sure that I'm safe? Um, how can I make sure that I, my immediate needs are taken care of? And how do I de-risk things, right? Uh, and then Sorry, in the how do you do what? Uh, de-risk. De-risk. Okay. How do I de-risk things? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so, okay. Right? And so um, I think uh, the, a lot of terminology people use is, you know, abundance versus scarcity. And that, mm -hmm. I think, adds a level of value judgment, right? I think people say scarcity is bad, abundance is good, right? Um, you know, this, I think it's important to, if you're in a situation where you need to survive, that's, a, that's the best skill to have. If you had this abundance mindset and walked over to you, the, the people, you know, hiding in the, in the, you know, woods waiting to ambush you and said, hello, friend, uh, you know, that probably wouldn't work out so well for you. Um, you know, and so... Uh, so there, there's value in having that mindset, but then when it comes to launching a business, if your your kind of go-to uh, approach to everything is this, um, you know, survival mindset, that can create some challenges in launching a business. Yes. Um, now, in the same way, you know, there are a lot of people who you know see the world where everything's an opportunity and everything's you know comes easy and all you have to do is ask and the world opens up for you. And, and they assume all kinds of opportunity in business, which can be a great strength. Of course, that can also be a weakness as well, right? Where you naively overcommit to too many things and over leverage yourself and all kinds of other things, right? And so recognizing those, uh, those mindsets has been very important to us. And so we did develop some curriculum um, at the request of some partners um, specifically positioned to dig deep on those, those mindset issues and explore those mm -hmm. mindsets. Um, for communities that have been historically marginalized. And what we found, this is actually really exciting and interesting, is that actually, while maybe historically marginalized communities have a higher ratio of people who come, you know, have one mindset predominant than another, that's actually mm -hmm. a human thing. Like all of us in some way have the internal conflict or those, those tendencies. 
and we found it's actually more helpful to address those things as a whole. So um, what we've done is we've kind of worked all of those um, kind of mindset type uh, um, engagements and interactions into all of our support models and engagement processes because we think it's healthy for everybody to be more aware of where they come from. Um, yeah. For people who maybe have barriers, it's more helpful for them to be aware of those barriers and how they affect their, their work and life and business. And for people who have privilege, it's more effective for them to know their privilege and their um, maybe uh, their, their, their naive um, assumption that everything is just going to be handed to them on a silver platter. And so um, we found that just um, digging more into those, um, into those dynamics and having conversations um, around those and having diverse groups of people who come from a variety of backgrounds and seeing that perspective from each other is actually the most powerful thing. Wow, interesting. That's, and, and, and of course, I, to be careful, I wanna go back and say that that depends on having that structure in place that establishes ground rules of mutual respect and not making you know untoward assumptions about other people and et cetera, so that people can be honest in that cohort, especially when they're first getting to know each other, of of you know being open about what their mindset is. So absolutely. And so it requires doing a little bit of a cultural reset because if you enter into that kind of conversation, given our wider culture of some kind of structural racism and other things, right? There might not be the freedom to have some of those conversations. Um, and and people might not be able to show up as their whole selves, right? Um, but when you're able to, and this is what we love about the co-starters community as a whole, is part of that clarity of purpose is we're all here together because we believe that we can make our communities better, right? By helping each other, full stop. So it doesn't matter who you are, what your gender is, your race is, your, um, you know, if you live on the other community that we compete with on the other side of the, the region, you know, um, whatever, um, you know, if you, uh, you know, uh, smell like garlic, like, you know, we're here to help each other figure stuff out. Um, and so, um, we Sorry, found that we, the garlic was like perfect. That's just on my mind because we've been eating so much garlic over the past week that my wife and I, uh, we, we've got our own social distancing, I think work, worked out by accident. Um, and so, so yeah, mutual understanding, mutual respect. Absolutely. Like when you can create that safe space to kind of be yourself and figure out life together, that is just life-giving and transformational, and it helps address all these other like, really complicated, thorny issues. And so I really, I truly believe we can change the world. We can address structural racism. We can address historic marginalization, marginalization, all that stuff. If we get down to like people like me, myself, working on myself, you know, you working on you, us coming together, both of us want to be better people and are committed to working on ourselves to do that and are open to hearing from others. To, to learn how we're how we can improve and where we're where our blind spots are if we enter into that type of trusting open relationship where we want to improve each other uh, we want to be improved by being with each other um then there is just no end of positive effects societally and for us personally and for our business friends so it all it all layers on top of each other wonderful isaac added that steve k in lexington talks about mutual understanding and mutual respect as the foundation of effective partnerships. And I, I think that's definitely true. I can also say that a little bit of judicious, uh, self-imposed social distancing can be very good for a marriage. And, you know, 20, 27 years of experience, I'll, I'll, I'll add that one to the equation. <laughs> We've got a few minutes left. Um, is there anything else? So, so I wanna ask about kind of where co-starters is going kind of what you see coming on the horizon but i also want to sort of give you the opportunity in that to to lay out for us anything else that you think we should be be thinking about working on talking about doing um you know in national work in local work in whether we're in you know, whatever role of people working on making communities better we happen to 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 take. So what do you want to take us home with? Yeah, and I, uh, we've been talking about it this whole time. I, I just, the, I think what's been made really clear globally is that right now, um, 
small businesses, the, both the value of small businesses in communities and, and as business owners, you know, the, the way we build up the local culture of our community and the, the local social fabric is so key and so important and so, so valuable. And at the same time is threatened maybe more than it has in, you know, in, in at least recent history that we, we can remember um, mm -hmm. where small business as a whole um, is being decimated in so many ways and large businesses are eating that up, that, that market share and, and are being uh, even, even stronger than they were when they were already creating a lot of uh, difficulty for local businesses. So I think with that context, the, the need to organize um, in community and build strong communities of support um, and to not be just one solo business owner, you know, trying to fight the world. Um, but larger and larger groups that uh, really this this network that, you know, we're, we're here on this this uh, webinar about, you know, is, is one of those key resources. Any way we can build up uh, networks, associations um, that are meaningful, right, deep, meaningful relationships where there is that strong trust um, so that we can weather this together and build up, uh, you know, uh, greater value together. Um, I, I just can't stress how important that is and how much that's just vital to our survival and success going forward. So to me, it's just any way that, that we can do that, whether it's just finding like three friends who have businesses to commit to helping each other over the next six months in some way, some basic structure, we're just gonna go get on a call every two weeks and check in, right? It could be that, right? Yeah. Whatever works for you, or it could be, you know, using a model like, like CoStarter's model to, to build even stronger uh, 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 community and stronger relationships and all that. Any of those things, I think, are, are essential and valuable and can have the most uh, kind of payoff for our time. So that's the thing I would like to leave us with. Uh, let's build more meaningful relationships and uh, build stronger communities together that make us more healthy, make our businesses more healthy, make the world a better place. Thank you. And one of the one of the things that's so fascinating to me in what you're describing is that I'm hearing echoes in my head, even of the few conversations we've I've, I've had the privilege to do on this series with people talking about um, building those kind of trusting relationships, making those kinds of um, kind of community building. There is such a groundswell, forgive my itching nose. Um, there is such a groundswell, it seems like, developing around this understanding. And it's a shared understanding that I think is 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 really percolating up um, and you're right it comes up against the risk of um, larger businesses taking more and more of that because that's the way the structure has been the structure that is still the dominant structure in place but one of the things that i love about what you described is that building of the collaboration, even if it's three people who just commit to sort of, sort of help each other, um, and with you know working with Amoeba, I've been seeing some amazing, yeah, you know, just networks of people, and in some cases they they are networks of people who, a few years ago would have been like, nope, this is my thing, this is my thing, this is my little thing right here, and nobody else messes with it, and nobody, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, and now all of a sudden they are they're really seeking that community and that network. Um, so I think it's an enormous, enormous opportunity um, to move into that future that you've described. And as you've said, even if the train looks like it's going the same, you know, rattling down the, the, the track toward, you know, whatever Armageddon would appear to be at the end of that, we have the ability to almost defy gravity and build the parallel system that I think we said had to be pulled by a bear, but like I'm a little bit fuzzy on that part now, um, you know, on on the other side. So, Enoch, thanks a ton. You know, I could I could sit and talk with you literally all day. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah, and I'm looking forward to us uh, hanging out uh, one day soon. Thank you so much for having me here. It's been great. Absolutely. All right, you take care of yourself. All right. Um, and give those little, all those little buggers a hug for me. Sounds good. Appreciate all it. All right. Take all care. Right. Bye. This preeminently the time to speak the truth frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly speaking.
facing conditions in our country today, this great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, 